to all our Emmanuel Church family and friends. I hope this finds you all doing well on this last day of January. It's hard to believe we've already gone through the first month of 2021, and here we are. So um, just wanted to let you know if you've been waiting for your financial statements, those have been mailed out uh, at the end of this past week. So if you haven't received it yet, you should be receiving it by the beginning of this upcoming week. If you don't, please feel free to contact the office and Johanna can um, get your information and have her be in or have you be then in touch with Cindy. Um, so just keep an eye out for those. Uh, really, the only other things that I have to talk about today are health updates and prayer concerns. Uh, I'd like to start out with Max S, who was hospitalized last week uh, for an infection, and he is at the time of this at the time of this recording, uh, he is still in the hospital. So. Um, we're going to add Max S to our prayer list. Uh, Jessica F is home and she's doing well. She um, had a good report from her doctors, and so we're we're very excited that she's she's doing well at home. Uh, Mary D also came through surgery with no troubles, and she's home recovering well too. Rachel G had her biopsy last week and got her test results and everything came back negative. So we give thanks for the positive report with her. And then also speaking of good reports, uh, Pastor Rich had another blood test last week and that came out just fine again. So he's holding his own there and doing well. So we are grateful for that. Um, those are about the only specific prayer requests I have. There are a handful of other prayer concerns that are out there where people have asked to remain anonymous. So as I've said in the past, we just a blanket prayer request for your whole church, Emmanuel Church family. Um, thank you for taking the time for keeping these people in your thoughts and prayers. I know it means a lot to each of the people who I've mentioned as well as those names who I didn't request. Um, other than that, hope you're all doing well, staying healthy. Uh, if there's anything we can do, um, just to keep in touch or, or whatever, feel free to contact us Monday through Thursday, 9 to 3 at the office at the church here. So take care, God bless, and have a wonderful day. Greetings, members and friends of Emmanuel United Church of Christ. As always, so pleased that you've decided to join us in our reflection on sacred scripture here this fourth Sunday of Epiphany. Before we look into a very, very special story concerning Jesus, and Epiphany is all about learning more about who God is as we discover God's character, God's mercy, God's compassion and love through the person of Jesus Christ, I want to draw your heart's attention to reflecting on how the Spirit might speak to you through this scripture this morning by inviting you to a call to worship, a call to worship based on Psalm 103 and Psalm 130. The words in bold you're invited to respond with if you desire, if not, just listen in. Bless God who forgives your sins, everyone, the Lord is compassionate and merciful, abounding in steadfast love. God doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is God's steadfast love toward us. If God kept records on wrongdoings, who would stand a chance? But there is forgiveness with the Lord, a God worthy of our worship. Bless God who forgives your sins, every one. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, abounding in steadfast love. And with that call before us, I invite you to follow along as I read from the Gospel according to John, chapter 8, verses 2 through 11. Early in the morning, Jesus came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They said this to test him, so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, 
Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. That is the story we will reflect upon in a message titled, Drop Your Stone, The Clenched Fist, and The Open Hand. We have such an awkward and uncomfortable and upsetting situation here in our story. If you put yourself in this predicament, you can see how the emotions run so high in this story. You, you can feel the fear that must grip the woman, the humiliation, the shame as she's the object of the terror of an angry mob. You can feel the rage that fills the religious leaders. You can perhaps sense some of the disgust that travels throughout the crowd. And in the middle of all this fear and shame and rage and disgust is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's been placed in a very, very precarious situation. In the middle of his teaching in the temple, his teaching is disrupted. It's disrupted by some religious leaders that toss a woman into the middle of the crowd and accuse that woman of adultery. They say that they have caught her in adultery, verse 3, caught her in the very act. They had seized her while she was with a partner who was not her husband. And tossing the woman into the midst of the crowd that Jesus is teaching, they question Jesus in verse 4, and they say, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. There's no doubt about it. We caught her. Now verse 5, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? This is a question that is not an innocent question. It is a gotcha question. This is part of an elaborate trap to accuse Jesus, to get him between a rock and a hard place. You see there in verse 6, they said this not because they really had a question. They didn't want any kind of answer. They knew what the possible answers were. They wanted to trip Jesus up so that they might have some charge to bring against him. You see, here's what they are plotting. If Jesus says, well, you should forgive her, they can say, but you're going against the law of Moses. Uh, you are not enforcing Moses' law. You don't stand for law and order. You don't stand for Torah. But if he says, go ahead with the stoning, if he says, go ahead and follow the law, they could then say to his followers, you see your master is not so good. Look at what he's suggesting for this poor woman. And even more, they could understand that he was going against Rome because under Roman occupation, only Romans could pass a death sentence and thus Jesus would be guilty of treason. So either way they have him. If he forgives her, then he is undermining the law of Moses. If he says, go ahead and follow the law, he is guilty of treason and they can turn him into the authorities. That's at the heart of their trap. And so they say, Jesus, what do you say? Because they believe they have him in their sights. They have him in their trap. They believe that any way he answers will condemn Jesus. The problem, however, is Jesus just simply won't take the bait. He bends down. You look at the very bottom of our reading on the screen. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. Jesus sees through the trap. He knows that there's something fishy, something weaselly going on here. And he knows this because of what's before him. This is a trap that's using human bait. 
The woman was of no concern to the scribes and Pharisees. She was just a piece of meat, just bait for the trap. And they treat her, in their opinion, as the worm that she is. They're not really interested in her. They're not really interested in her injured husband. They're only interested in trapping Jesus. And so Jesus sees that and sees something fishy going on. But he also knows something because Jesus knows the Torah. He knows the law. There's something suspicious in their zeal for the law. They're being rather selective about the law that they want to follow. And the clear evidence of that is, where's the man? If she was caught in the act, as they say, we caught her committing adultery, then where's the partner? He should have been brought along too. He should have been placed right there in the middle of the crowd, right alongside the woman, because after all, it takes two to tango. And they say they caught her in the very act. Where is the man? Because Moses's law is very explicit that Leviticus 20.10, Deuteronomy 22.22, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. According to the law, both should be stoned. And so Jesus sees something fishy is going on, and instead of answering, he bends down and writes on the ground. It's not really the content of what he's writing that's important. Many people write endless pages about what is Jesus writing on the ground as he stooped over, but that's not really what is important. What is important is that he refuses to play by their rules. He refuses to engage the question as they've posed it. And thus he's ignoring and disengaging. You don't have to respond to every question that's offered you. Sometimes the questions are just crazy. And so Jesus is refusing to play the game. This is an expression of indifference and perhaps even disappointment with the proceedings. But the religious leaders will not let him off the hook, and they continue to press him with questions, as you see in verse 7, even though Jesus continues to write, not offering an answer. Finally, they persist long enough that he, Jesus responds in verse 7 with this phrase that we're all familiar with, let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw the stone at her. Let anyone without sin. Jesus essentially says, you know, the law says adulterers must be stoned, then let her be stoned, but let the sinless one among you be the first to throw the stone at her. I'm not saying that the law of Moses is wrong. I'm just saying, Jesus is saying, if we're going to get serious about that, there's more than one lawbreaker present. Let anyone who is without sin, without sin, be the first to throw the stone at her. Verse 8, and once again he bent down and wrote on the ground. He is finished with his statement. That's all he's got to say on the matter. If you will, Jesus does one of these. He does a mic drop. Let the one without sin cast the first stone. Drop the mic. That's all I've got to say about this issue. And it's that silence that gives the accusers time to reflect on what Jesus has just said. Perhaps they perceive their heartlessness toward this woman as just as immoral as the promiscuity of the woman. Perhaps they begin to reflect on the fact that Jesus says, let the one without sin, and they realize, well, they as well are sinners. Perhaps they realize that the difference between them and the woman is not a difference between apples and oranges, but a matter of simple degrees because they are sinners like her. Whatever it is that makes them realize their sinfulness, we note that one by one, they begin to retreat. First, the elders, and perhaps this is always true that those with most maturity and most experience 
are able to recognize that, you know, we can't stand against this accusation. And then the younger ones begin to leave after the elders, because, you know, as you're younger, you're more of an idealist. Uh, you perhaps don't quite see yourself as clearly as you should. That's just part of growing in maturity. But one by one, they all leave until Jesus is left alone with the woman. And it's at this point that he finally addresses her. And he says, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? He addresses her as a person, not as object, not as a bait, uh, not as just someone to use to make a point, but he sees her as someone to address. And she says to him, no one condemns me, sir. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, sin no more. What's interesting here is Jesus, who is the sinless one, who is the only one that would have been in a position to cast the first stone, refuses to condemn her. Because in Jesus, we see the heart of God. We see God's mercy. We see God's compassion. We see God's empathy. He does not condemn her, but notice, neither does he condone her behavior. Adultery is hurtful. It's painful. It's wrong. And so he essentially says to her, don't do it again. He holds to the law by rejecting adultery, but he goes further than the law. He doesn't just kind of wash away adultery. It is a sin, but he doesn't condemn her for it. Instead, he shows her mercy, and with that mercy comes a whole new lease on life. What's interesting about this story is it's really not about adultery. I hope you don't think that. It's about something far more insidious. It's about passing judgment. It's about judgmentalism, our capacity, our proneness to condemn others. It is a story that shows us that sometimes the most religious ones among us, the ones who should know God's mercy, are the ones quickest to condemn, to use religion to destroy others. And after all, it is so easy to condemn others. We so clearly see evil in others, and we're so blind to the evil in our own lives. And because of that blindness, you know, we see the the log in another's eyes, but we don't see the splinter in our own. Because of that inherent judgmentalism that we all have to wrestle with, we are ready to cast stones at a moment. We're so quick to use religion as a weapon rather than as an instrument of compassion. It's as if our stones are just locked and loaded, ready to be thrown at a moment's notice. And what's interesting here is that for Jesus, judgmentalism is a far more serious sin than adultery. That's the sin that had to be addressed in this particular account. And Jesus wants us to be free from it, to drop our stones. He wants us to recognize that we all need mercy, that we all need a compassionate glance. We all need open arms rather than a fist clenched with a stone ready to throw at a moment's notice. And I know what some of you might feel as I'm saying this right now. You're doing this, you're going, but, 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 but there must be someone we should stone. Notice Jesus didn't say, let the one who's never committed adultery throw the stone. He says, let the one without sin. There's no room for any of us to get on our moral high horse, to condemn others because they commit a specific kind of sin that we have not. There's no room for that. Let the one without sin. If the list of sins you have in your mind that outrage you, that cause you to bring up your stone, are long, if that list includes things that you think you'd never do, then you are the one that needs to hear most clearly what Jesus is saying. 
because he doesn't say, let the one who doesn't commit your favorite list of sins that you'd never commit. He says, let the one without sin, because we all are in need of mercy. And as Christ followers, we just simply shouldn't be quick to condemn. We shouldn't be quick to throw stones. We should instead be quick to love and redeem because Jesus shows us the heart of God. It is a heart that is not looking to condemn. It is a heart looking to redeem. For this very same gospel, just chapters earlier, has that wonderful passage that we all love to quote, for God so loved the world that God sent the only Son in order that we might be saved. But we often forget verse 17, the immediately following verse, for God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The sinless one is a friend of sinners. He is, as the sinless one, the only one there that could have thrown a stone, but he refuses to condemn. What therefore gives you or I the right to throw stones? The simple solution for us all is we need to drop our stones. Because only when we drop our stones are our friend, hands free to embrace sinners like us. Carl Sandburg put it so well when he writes, the single clenched fist lifted and ready, or the open asking hand held out and waiting. Choose, for we meet by one or the other. We are either those who condemn coming at others with clenched fist ready to throw rocks, or we are like Jesus who comes with open hands to embrace sinners. As we draw to a close, hear once more the words of Jesus, for they are words not only to the woman, but to us. Verse 11, neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, sin no more. The sinless one does not condemn. He does not condemn you or I but he does not condone sin as well. And he invites us to enter into a new life, to go and sin no more. For the woman, that meant no longer commit adultery. But for the rest of us, it means get rid of judgmentalism. Get rid of that insistent desire to throw your stones in condemnation. Drop your stone. Instead of a clenched fist, offer an open hand and show mercy as you've been shown mercy. In response, I invite you to pray with me this prayer. Merciful God, far too often we stand propped by our misguided belief that endless bickering over details about law and conduct honor your will. At times, people become pawns worthy of our stoning, worthy of our condemnation. We use painful, critical, even fatal words, intending to throw sticks and stones to bring others down. But Jesus used words of healing and hope. May we do the same today as we approach our neighbors and friends and as we approach the sinless one who died in our place, the same Jesus who says to us, I do not condemn you, go and sin no more. Today we celebrate God's forgiveness, which does not condemn us for our faults, but gives us another chance to do what is right. May this divine mercy guide us to be merciful to others as we have received mercy. And please, sanctifying God, may it lead us to lay down our stones and open our arms with welcome and understanding. Just and merciful God, you take pity even on sinners and you continue with them a dialogue of grace and hope. Help us too, never to condemn, never to give up on people, but to be patient, understanding, and forgiving, together with you and Jesus, your Son, who lives with you in the Holy Spirit forever and ever. And to this end, we pray with great boldness with all who call on your name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I love that story. It is challenging to us all. We are all prone to seeing the log in others' eyes. We are all quick to judge and criticize and condemn and throw out our sticks and stones. And yet Jesus calls us to a different way, to a way of compassion and mercy and peace and understanding, to a way that still seeks to live in accordance with God's righteous will, but extends mercy and an olive branch in all of our dealings with others. Well, until we connect with others, until we connect again, I want to leave you with these words. May the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the blessed fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.